Welcome. Thank you so much for coming along today. Now, we are here in relation to the Global Existential Summits, um, which is very exciting, but we are going to be embracing some spontaneity and creativity and freedom and going mm. off the beaten track, not asking the usual line of questioning and exploration that I have been accustomed to. And you have provided me with three um, very exciting questions that we're going to go into during our interview today. But before we do that, for those who might not be familiar with yourself or with your work, how would you introduce yourself? Well, thank you, Natalie, for the invitation to speak to the summit. I am Robert Kramer. I am a psychotherapist in Budapest, Hungary, where I am also a professor of psychoanalysis at the leading university in Hungary, which is called Etvos Lorand University. I'm very pleased by that title because the only other person to hold that title in Hungary was the great psychoanalyst Sándor Ferenczi. So I am the second person in the history of Hungary to, to be called a professor of psychoanalysis. I am, as far as I know, the only practicing Rankian therapist in Europe and possibly the world. <laughs> I, I have not done a survey of all the therapists in the world, but I have not found one yet. So I am in a unique position, I believe, to introduce your viewers, listeners, to the mysterious Otto Rank, about whom many have heard and very few really understand. So let's begin. Natalie, what question would you like me to answer first? Well, I think a good starting place might be who was <laughs> Otto Rank? Otto Rank was Sigmund Freud's closest colleague in Vienna during the formative years of psychoanalysis from 1906 until 1926. In 1907, when he was only 23, Rank published a book called The Artist, which was the first psychoanalytic book not written by Freud. A year earlier, Freud had hired Rank to be his personal secretary, virtually adopting him as a foster son and paying for his way to get a PhD in literature at the University of Vienna. Uh, uh, Freud was so impressed by Rank's erudition that he invited his protege to contribute two chapters on poetry and myth in 1914 to the interpretation of dreams. And thereafter, Otto Rank's name would appear under Freud's under the title page, on the title page of the foundational work of psychoanalysis for the next 15 years. He became Freud's most intimate colleague in Vienna. He would visit Freud every Wednesday night for dinner with the professor and his family before meetings of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society, over which Rank presided during Freud's many absences. He was also the managing director of Freud's publishing house called the Fairlock. And he was the main editor of the two leading psychoanalytic journals. Next to Freud, Rank was the most senior training analyst and Franz Alexander called him once, the One Man Training Institute of Vienna. By 1923, at only 39 years old, Rank had become virtually indispensable to Freud, then approaching 70. 
diagnosed in 1923 with cancer, Freud was given no more than five years to live by his surgeons. And therefore, he officially designated Ronk as his heir. But trouble was brewing. Ronk published a book one year later in 1924 called The Trauma of Birth. And this shocked Freud. Why did it shock Freud? Ronk said in this book that each new arrival on the planet finds its first object, its mother, only promptly to lose her again, the primal trauma. Ronk said that the newborn suffers anxiety, which by the way comes from the Latin, angere, which means to squeeze or strangle. Ronk said the newborn suffers anxiety the moment it's thrust out of the womb, whether through normal birth or cesarean delivery. And he was making an existential statement. What he was saying here was that the pain of experiencing difference for the first time, difference is felt acutely during the process of being born. I just quote one sentence from his book. He says, it's the first psychical content of which the human being is conscious. Unquote. That's the first moment of consciousness during the painful trauma of birth. And then he says, only love can heal the feeling of pain that difference evokes in the tiny, helpless human being, which has been forced out of its warm, protective home into a cold, alien world. That's an existential statement. And then he went on to say in the book, with birth, the feeling of oneness, of wholeness, that was experienced in the embryonic, embryonic state is lost. And he said, we seek for a lifetime to regain the lost feeling of wholeness. And this ceaseless yearning for oneness, which he saw everywhere in human beings is a universal experience, is a major impetus, he said, for the creation of myth, religion, philosophy, and art. And human culture then serves as a kind of shield against existential anxiety and creates what we can see is a humanly significant world. What is he saying? The larger message of the trauma of birth, which has been very misunderstood by uh, readers throughout the 100 years since its first publication, what he was saying is that, in, in, that in, in an infinite, vast, unknown, and frightening universe, the symbols of myth, religion, philosophy, and art invest human life with security and meaning allowing us, he said, to recreate the lost sense of unity we once felt in the womb. And then he proposed something that shocked Freud. Freud actually was willing to tolerate this philosophical argument that Rock made in his book, but he did not tolerate the next, <laughs> the extension of it. Ronk said the mother-child relationship is the template for the encounter between patient and analyst who unite in deep sharing 
in order for the patient to learn how to bear the trauma of separation with less pain than before. And here's a quote from his book, The Trauma of Birth, which I like very much. It's on page 215 of the English translation, easily obtainable in any library. Quote, not only is the patient, says Ronk, always conscious that the cure must one day be finished, but every single hour demands from him the repetition in miniature of the fixation on the mother and the severance from the mother till he is in a position to finally carry it through, to finally be born or to, as he would say, to give birth to himself or herself. And then he went on in the book to say something that's a very, very powerful existential statement. The trauma of birth ends only with the trauma of death, which is the final separation and the final union. And another quote from his book that I like very much comes on page 114. Quote, everyone born sinks back into the womb from which he or she once came into the realm of light. A very poetic statement. And in fact, the trauma of birth is actually a poem, not a scientific work. Rank considered himself a novelist, an artist, and poet. And much of the difficulty that people have in reading Rank's writings is that they don't know that he's actually a metaphysician of psychoanalysis, as Anais Nin later called him, the only metaphysician of psychoanalysis. So that's the book, and Freud was shocked. He wrote him a letter, which my colleague E. James Lieberman and I published in our collection of all the Freud Ron correspondence published in 2012. Uh, Jim and I collected all these letters. I had to travel to many countries to find them, including England and France. And most of them were at the Columbia University's Rare Book and Manuscript Library, which holds the Ronk collection. But, Ron, but Freud wrote a letter to Ronk that explains what terrified him about this book. Quote, you are the feared David and he's referring to the David and Goliath myth, you are the feared David who with the trauma of birth succeeds in devaluing my work. That was Freud's trauma because Freud had always treated mothers only as objects of male sexual desire. That's what he called the Oedipus complex. He always insisted on the preeminent significance of the child's relationship to its powerful father. People have forgotten that Freud gave no importance in his theory or therapy to the loving quality of the mother-child relationship. And also in none of his case histories did he ever see the mother's powerful will. In fact, women were basically failed men in Freud's theory at the time. And Ronk's book was promoting the idea that mothers are just as powerful as fathers and just as important in the infant's psyche and throughout development. Well, Freud and Ronk battled furiously over the trauma of birth for two years, from 1924 to 1926. Freud wrote letters to Ronk. Ronk wrote letters back to Freud. They met regularly to discuss their differences. Freud told Ferency, who at that time was Ronk's best friend, 
I am boiling with rage. That's a quote from a letter that Freud wrote to Ferenczi. He likened his mood. Again, this is a quote from a letter Freud wrote to Ferenczi. He likened his mood, quote, to an absolutism moderated by treacherous assassination. In other words, he felt so enraged by Ronk's book that he was ready to assassinate him. And this was his number two man. This was the man he had selected to be his ear. This was the second most powerful man in the little psychoanalytic world in the early 1920s. And then it got really personal between the two. Freud took out of his armamentarium his usual weapon, psychoanalytic interpretation. And he wrote a letter to Ronk that infuriated Ronk. This is also a letter we published, Jim Lieberman and I, in our 2012 collection of letters between Freud and Ronk. Here's Freud to Ronk. Quote, the elimination of the father in your theory strikes me as revealing too much the influence of personal factors in your life, unquote. He's accusing Otto Rank of having an Oedipus complex when Rank has just created the very first pre-Oedipal theory of psychoanalysis. Rank was infuriated. <laughs> I know, because in his papers, there are four drafts of letters that he wrote to Freud. Four times he tried to write a response to this Oedipal assassination of his intentions in writing the book, which he had intended only to support Freud and serve as a new way of understanding human being. Let's look at our relationship to our mothers. Let's include a mother relationship and the transference. In fact, Ronk was the first to see transference in a maternal way rather than Freud's paternal way. So Ronk sat, he was then in New York in a hotel room giving, uh, he had gone to New York to give lectures on his new theory in 1924. He drafted four letters and then this is, the, this is the letter he finally sent. It was actually the mildest one of all the four. He says, that's not so, of course, and cannot be. It would be nonsense, he wrote. I mean, Freud is saying he's forgotten the father. It's nonsense. I've only attempted to assign him the correct place, unquote. What he's saying is, Professor Freud, what is so hard about understanding that mother comes first and then father? What is blocking you from appreciating the mother's powerful role in the infant psyche? Well, after many surprising twists and turns, many meetings, which lasted throughout the spring of 1925, Ronk would go to Freud's home in Bergasa 19, and have analytic conversations with him almost every day for months. They talked and talked and talked and talked. And Ronk realized that Freud is never going to allow a role for women in his theory or ever, ever integrate the mother-child relationship into psychoanalytic theory. He was a lost cause. And so very reluctantly, with great sadness, Rank left Vienna in 1926. He resigned from all his powerful positions. He was the number two person, vice president of Vienna Psychoanalytic Society, editor of the two leading journals, the One Man Training Institute of Vienna, the managing director of Freud's publishing house. He was running the show. 
you might call him the prime minister of psychoanalysis and Freud might be called the king of psychoanalysis. That's how powerful Rank was. And also he made many enemies. He had rivals, including Ernest Jones, who loathed Rank and feared Rank and later got even with Rank when Jones published the three volume biography of Freud in the late 1950s, he libeled Rank, calling him psychotic. And that diagnosis, let me put that in quotation marks, lasted for decades and even to the present day. Members of the International Psychoanalytic Association, which is the foundation or the, the, the basic uh, organization of psychoanalysts in the world know virtually nothing about Rank. And if you go to their website, you will see only one minor reference to Otto Rank as an insignificant figure, as the secretary of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society, which of course he was, but, but certainly it was far, far more important than that. So, Ronk left, he resigned all his positions and moved to Paris where he became famous as the therapist for artists who were blocked in their creativity. And he treated many famous people, including Anaïs Nin, who visited Ronk in 1933 because she was unable to finish a novel that she had started. And she was so transformed by his uh, therapy that she wrote extensively about Rank in her famous diaries published in, in the early 60s. Volume one had at least a hundred pages about Otto Rank and her therapy with him in Paris in 1933. So let me stop there and why don't we continue? with your questions. It's bonkers to really have a, a tr true example of how someone can just be wiped out of history. Um, just gosh. So, I mean, obviously Otto Rank has inspired you, yeah. but how did he inspire or indeed influence Carl Rogers and Rollo May? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because most people don't know that Otto Rank was the single most important influence on the development in America of humanistic psychology and existential psychology. And of course, the two most important names in America for these two uh, therapies are Carl Rogers and Rollo May. So, When he was catapulted out of Freud's orbit in the mid 1920s, Rank started to lecture at universities across America in the mid 30s on how his model, which he called relationship therapy, differed from Freud's psychoanalysis. Now, in Freud's psychoanalysis, and even to the present, the analyst is supposed to be indifferent and basically unfeeling. And Freud gave a famous metaphor, the analyst should be like a surgeon operating on a patient. Now, against Freud, Rank was arguing already in the mid 1920s that a real relationship with the therapist showing empathy and respect for the patient was essential for healing. Interpretations, Rank insisted, were often more harmful than helpful. And you might say that Rank had made a Copernican turn. He shifted the source of therapeutic results from the helper to the person being helped. He moved out of the classical tradition into a completely revised concept of the role of the therapist as secondary, leaving to the patient the active role of the creator in the therapeutic process. Basically, it's a process of self-creation. That's what the end goal was to be, 
full arms relationship therapy. But Freud had always insisted, and even today, almost all psychoanalysts continue to insist that the analysts' interpretations are at the center of change. And Rock gave a lecture in 1935, shortly before meeting Carl Rogers, who was then an unknown young counselor working at a child guidance clinic in Rochester. Rock gave a lecture in 1935, which I published in 1996 in my collection of Rock's American Lectures, which is called A Psychology of Difference. The American Lectures of Otto Ronks, published by Princeton University Press. And in this 1935 lecture, Ronks says something that every therapist who practices person-centered therapy or client-centered therapy or any kind of therapy derived from Carl Rogers' work will recognize instantly. Here's what Ronks said in 1935, one year before he met Carl Rogers. Quote from my book, The Psychology of Difference. The whole psychoanalytic approach is centered around the therapist, said Ron. Real therapy has to be centered around the client. Ron was using the term client already in 1935. Rogers heard about Otto Ronk's new relationship therapy from a social worker who had been trained by Ronk at the University of Pennsylvania after Ronk left Vienna. This social worker, whose name is, I've never been able to uh, identify, so it's an unknown person. This social worker told Rogers that Otto Ronk was not doing interpretation therapy the way Freud was, and Freud was still living in Vienna at the time. He was doing what Ron called relationship therapy, and Rogers became very interested. What is this? So Rogers invited the world-famous Otto Ronk to Rochester in 1936 to give a weekend workshop. By this date, Otto Ronk was world-famous. His books could be found in English, French, and German, and Carl Rogers had not published a word. He was totally unknown. Well, after this workshop in 1936, just for a weekend, Friday through Sunday, Rogers abandoned his Freudian training in interpretive therapy, which he had received at Columbia University's Teachers College, where he received his PhD in counseling. Rogers created what he called first non-directive therapy. Then he called it client-centered therapy. And finally, he used the phrase person-centered therapy, which is the phrase most people probably uh, will recognize most easily. And this, these principles of client-centered therapy became a pillar of humanistic psycho uh, psychology. Now, how do we know that Rogers was affected by his workshop conducted by Ronk in 1936? Well, he spoke about it, but very briefly, he really didn't quote Ronk. He only mentions Ronk maybe two or three times in all of his writings. But he explicitly said and always acknowledged that it was his meeting with Otto Ronk in 1936 that transformed him from a Freudian to what you might call, well, you might call him a Ronkian then. And this is what he told, uh, this is what he said in an interview once. He said, quote, I became infected with Ronkian ideas after that weekend workshop. He read people who had been trained by Ronk, including Jesse Taft, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Work. And Taft wrote beautifully, and Ronk was a difficult writer, so it's not unusual or, or uh, I think it's, it could be easily understood that Rogers would not quote Ronk because Ronk was difficult to read. But Jesse Taft, who was easy to read, was very often mentioned by, uh, by Rogers and everybody in his inner circle as, as, uh, as the best writer on therapy. And Jesse Taft 
was Ron's closest colleague at the University of Pennsylvania School of, School of Social Work for over a decade. And also another a bit of evidence that I found about Rogers. He was asked once in a, in a video, in an interview, which is now on videotape, by the Encinitas Family Clinic, I believe it's in California, and there was a videotape of it. Somebody asked him, who was your influence? And he says, quote, Otto Rank and my clients. And there's been a lot of research conducted over the last 20 years on Rogers, and everybody agrees now that Otto Rank was the single most important influence on the thinking of Carl Rogers, who later became the most influential American psychologist of the 20th century. That's based on surveys done by psychologists published in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, Rogers, perhaps along with William James, is the single most influential American psychologist of the 20th century. And client-centered therapy is directly connected to that weekend workshop Rogers asked Otto Rank to conduct for him and his staff in Rochester in 1936. So Rogers acknowledged always Rank was his biggest influence. And that means Otto Rank is the father of humanistic psychology in America. Now, what about existential psychology? Well, everyone considers Rollo May to be the, the founder of existential psychology in America. Of course, the Europeans have a different history and heritage. Emily Van Dusen can tell you more about that, but I'm only speaking here about America. In the mid 1930s, Rollo May undertook a psychoanalysis with a man named Dr. Harry Bone, who had been trained by Otto Rank in Paris in the early 1930s. And for two or three years, in the late 1930s, Rollo May was analyzed by Harry Bone. And Bone suggested that Rollo read all of Ronk's writings. Now, Rollo never met Otto Ronk, but he was so taken by Ronk's books, which at that time in English included will therapy, truth and reality, and art and artist, that he became totally magnetized by Ronk's ideas. Now, I wrote an article about this little known story, which is in press now at the journal called The Humanistic Psychologist. The title of this article is Discovering the Existential Unconscious. Rollo May encounters Otto Rank. So I can't, uh, I can't summarize this article because it's about 30 pages long, but I invite your viewers and watchers and, and, and listeners to send me an email. I would be more than delighted to email them a copy of my article, which tells the whole story of Rollo May's influence, uh, of, of Otto Rank's influence on Rollo May. Uh, I asked Rollo in 1996, uh, excuse me, it was 1994, just before he died. He died in 1994. I asked Rollo, I wrote him a letter. Uh, I got his contact information from my close friend, Kirk Schneider, who was a student of Rollo's for many years. And Kirk uh, knew Rollo's address. We had no email, or at least I didn't use email in 1994. So I wrote Rollo a letter and I said, dear Dr. May, I am compiling a collection of Ronk's American lectures, lectures, 22 lectures he gave in America from 1924 
until 1938, one year before his death. Would you be willing to write a foreword to these lectures by Ron? Because I know that you have always mentioned Otto Rock very favorably. And he said, he wrote back, he said, I'd be delighted to. And he wrote a foreword to my book just before he died. In fact, this foreword is the last piece of writing that Rollo ever wrote. And he said in it, the first sentence, I've actually memorized it because it's, it, was, it was so touching to me. The very first sentence of his foreword, which exists in the book today, the book is called The Psychology of Difference, The American Lectures of Otto Rock, Princeton University Press, 1996. He says, quote, I have long considered Otto Rock to be the great unacknowledged genius in Freud's circle. And later on in the, in the forward, he says, these lectures by Otto Rank are, quote, dazzling, unquote. Boy, was I happy to get a forward like that from Ronald May. Now, I want to make one more point about the title of my forthcoming article. The title is Discovering the Existential Unconscious. That's a term that I coined. And maybe it would be helpful to your viewers and listeners if I tried to at least summarize what this term means. So let me, actually, I wrote this down. If you don't mind, I'm going to have to look it up because it's, uh, it took me a long time to write this. So I am just going to go into my laptop now and pull out the article because I can't say it any better. Okay, so let me see if I can pull this up. I, I put it into one paragraph. And let's see if I can get it. All right, I got it up. And now it's on my screen. And let me find the paragraph that I would like to uh, quote to help your readers, uh, your, your listeners understand. What Ronk really said, you know, Otto Ronk is very difficult to read. And I have spent decades reading and rereading Otto Ronk and going to his papers at Columbia University in the Rare Book and Manuscript Library, Butler, Butler Library. So here it is. Okay. It took me 20 years to write this. <laughs> what did, what exactly did Ronk say? Uh, like most great thinkers, Rank had one big idea. And if I could sum up his one big idea in a single sentence, it would be this. And this is what I wrote in my, in my article. For any understanding of the universal suffering of human beings, isn't the strange consciousness of living the dim awareness that we're alive for a moment on a speck of dust as it spins meaninglessly around the sun itself, only a slightly larger speck of dust in the vast incomprehensible spaces of the cosmos? Isn't the strange consciousness of living the single most significant fact of human existence? I think so, but that's not an idea that is very prominent today. You won't find that on page one of the New York Times or in any of the peer-reviewed journal articles in the field of psychology, either in the United States or Great Britain. Well, what, what is, what is Ron saying? I, I coined this phrase, existential unconscious to simplify Ronk's very complex prose. Life, I think Ronk is suggesting, is an, is, life is an infinitesimal moment of light. 
not a holiday on earth sandwiched between two eternities of silence. This is what I call these two eternities of silence wrapped around all of us like a double helix. I call this the existential unconscious, although Rock never used this phrase. Now, uh, Ernest Becker, who was devoted to Otto Rank and uh, based his two great books on Rank's thought, uh, The Denial of Death and Escape from Evil, he observed in The Denial of Death that no matter how much science unravels the secrets of biology or chemistry or physics or the brain, science does not have a single word to say about what it means for a person to be alive and conscious on the planet Earth. You know, people forget that the nature of consciousness remains utterly mysterious. The neuroscientists cannot even agree on a definition of consciousness or a definition of a self that is conscious, much less, much less measure, either one. Uh, I remember the philosopher David Chalmers, professor at New York University, once said, we cannot explain how the water of the brain turns into the wine of consciousness. And what Otto Rahn called the consciousness of living, which is a term he coined, what he called the consciousness of living is identical in my opinion to the hard problem of consciousness. That's a term that David Chalmers coined. The hard problem of consciousness, which requires explaining how first person experiences of I am, how that first person experience of I am, which is a phrase that Rallo used very often, how that first experience of I am emerged in the cosmos. No one has a clue. No functional magnetic resonance imagery, M MRI, has ever shown a thought or a feeling in the brain. The only thing the MRI shows is blood circulation, which we assume is correlated with thinking and feeling, but nobody knows. Do you know that consciousness <laughs> Maybe you do know. Do you know that consciousness remains a mystery, wrapped in an enigma, shrouded in darkness? Uh, here's something that really will surprise people. The consciousness of living, Rank argued, he was turning Freud on his head. The consciousness, consciousness of living is far more terrifying than the sexual content of Freud's unconscious. The consciousness of living, in my view, is the existential unconscious. Unlike Rank, who was awed and humbled by the ontological mystery of consciousness, which he wrote about extensively in his books, Freud took consciousness for granted. He was a positivist. He never wondered about the strange fact that he was alive for a fraction of a second on an infinitesimally tiny speck of cosmic dust called the Earth, floating aimlessly in an incomprehensible sea of gazillions and gazillions of tiny particles of cosmic dust. So Rank maintained that conscious human beings 
are tossed eternally back and forth between fear of, of life, which, which in German he used the term Lebensangst, and fear of death. In German, he used the word Todesangst. Suffering is the cry of existence. Erwin Yalom read Otto Rank. Erwin Yalom today is the greatest living existential psychotherapist. He's 93 years old and quite active in, <laughs> in uh, California, where he continues to be a therapist. I communicate with him occasionally, send him emails back and forth. He, he summed up Otto Rank's view most beautifully in his, his 2008 book called Steering at the Sun. Overcoming the Terror of Death. So let me quote this uh, paragraph from Yalom, and then I will invite you to ask me the next question if you have any more left. <laughs> so here's Yalom after having read Otto Rank. And by the way, Yalom was introduced to Rank by Ronald May, who happened to have been his personal psychotherapist and later became his very, very close friend. So here's Yalom. In Ronk's view, the quote from his book, uh, Staring at the Sun, published in 2008. So I'm reading again from the screen here to get the exact, uh, exact words right. In, in Ronk's view, writes Yalom, a developing person strives for individuation, growth, and fulfillment of his or her potential, but at a cost, exclamation mark. <laughs> in emerging, expanding, and standing out from nature, an individual encounters, quote, life anxiety, quote, unquote, a frightening loneliness, a feeling of vulnerability, a loss of basic connection with a greater whole. When this life anxiety becomes unbearable, what do we do? Asks Erwin Yellow. We take a different direction. We go backward. We retreat from separateness and find comfort in merging. That is, infusing with and giving oneself up to the other. Yet despite its comfort and coziness, the solution of merger is unstable. Ultimately, one recoils from the loss of the unique self and sense of stagnation. Thus, merger, concludes Yalom, gives rise to death anxiety. Between these two poles, life anxiety and death anxiety, or individuation and merger, people shuttle back and forth their entire lives. And this formulation ultimately became the spine of Ernest Becker's extraordinary book, The Denial of Death. So let me stop there and invite further inquiry. So this is all very fascinating, all very interesting, but what does it mean? Why do you think that the 21st century will be the Rankian century? Well, thank you for asking that question. It's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an idea that I have been um, mulling over now for some years, and no one has ever made this proposition because very few people even know anything about Otto Rank. So why on earth would I make such a grandiose claim? Well, I have been following the research, the empirical research in terror management theory, a form, a branch, you might say, of social psychology that's based on Ernest Becker's book. The Denial of Death, which we know was rooted in Otto Rank's theory of life fear and death fear. That's the, that's the spine of the denial of death. And so Sheldon Solomon at Skidmore College in the US, along with uh, colleagues in over 60 countries around the world, have conducted over 1,500 experiments testing Becker's theories, which were based on Otto Rahm. And 
the research of terror management theoreticians is now so well established that every textbook in social psychology now includes Ernest Becker and Sheldon and his colleagues' empirical affirmation or, or let's say research into uh, Becker's claims in the denial of death. And that's a huge number of experiments and therefore it's well established. There are critics of this research. There are now people who are trying to overthrow Sheldon because they claim that they cannot reproduce some of his research, but I think that's a very minor thread in, in social psychology, which can easily be responded to and is being responded to by Professor Solomon and his colleagues. So I'm not going to go into that. What I'm trying to say is that Ronk's ideas have been more experimentally validated than any other psychoanalyst in history. Freud himself refused to consider experimental studies of psychoanalysis. He said it was, it was meaningless. I don't care about it. I know it, what I said is true and I don't need your experiments. So there is huge experimental support for Ronk's ideas. But there's also a continually strong support for humanistic and existential ideas in psychotherapy. For example, an article in 2016 by Professor Golan Shahar and Moran Schiller, who teach at Bar Ilan University in Tel Aviv, they wrote an article in 2016, and I, and I wrote down the very first sentence. So actually, it's their, it's their uh, yeah, it's the first sentence of the article. They say the humanistic existential movement, quote, has infiltrated not only the fortress of clinical psychology, but also mainstream academic psychology in general, and has assumed a quiet, albeit steadfast, control. What he's saying, or what they're saying, Professor Shahar and Professor Schiller, is that even the cognitive behavioral therapists are now accepting the principles of humanistic existential psychotherapy. They are. The, the CBT movement has now fully adopted the relationship model of Carl Rogers and even accepted considerable, to a considerable degree, the existential thinking of Rollo May and Emily Durson and her colleagues in Europe. CBT is no longer just CMB. It is also H and E, humanistic and existential. And I think that's a very reasonable conclusion based on recent articles and books by people in the CBT field, there is a merger taking place among all the therapeutic models, and they are merging into humanistic existential psychology with variations, of course, but that is the foundation. So what I argue and this is a tough argument to make, and people will not be willing to accept it until they read my article on Ronald May and some of my books. I make the argument, I make the case that if the 20th century was the century of Freud, which it was, he owned it. The 21st is shaping up to be the century of Otto Rank who was the first ex humanistic existential therapist in the world and the most incisive critic of Freud. It is Otto Rank's ideas, not Freud's, that are now at the heart of modern psychotherapy. It is very hard to find a single psychiatry department in a medical school in the US 
that teaches psychoanalysis. They used to own the medical school psychiatry department. In the 1950s and 60s, every chairman of every psychiatry department in American medical school was a Freudian. But today, science no longer looks kindly on Freud's psychoanalysis. It has collapsed because the empirical evidence isn't there. Of course, there are still pockets of psychoanalysts in Manhattan and San Francisco and London, but it no longer dominates the field of psychotherapy. It is just a very, very small uh, branch of psychotherapy. And even the psychoanalysts that I know of today are coming closer and closer to existential and humanistic principles. But they are still a minority. And the 12,000 member International Psychoanalytic Association uh, is by no means existentialist or humanistic in its therapeutic uh, position. It is, remains very closely aligned with Freud or Melanie Klein or Jacques Lacan, the French Freud, who is increasingly becoming dominant in the academy in the US and around the world and in various countries. He's particularly popular in Argentina and France, where of course he came from. And Lacan, <laughs> Lacan hated humanistic psychology. Although he, there are aspects of Lacan that are existential, but Lacan remains and remained a Freudian to the end of his days. So I argue following Golan Shahar and Moran Schiller in their 2016 article in the Journal of Psychotherapy Integration, I argue that the humanistic existential movement and mainstream academic psychology in general are now very much infused with existential and humanistic principles, which are rooted in Otto Rank's ideas because Rank was the greatest influence on Carl Rogers, founder of humanistic psychology in America, and Rollo May, founder of existential psychology in America. Where would you like to go now? Natalie Fraser. Well, I have now, we have now completed all of the questions that you have um, provided. However, I, I, before we come to a close, I would love to invite you to add anything that you might, that you might want to. Well, thank you, Natalie. I want to appreciate your initiative to bring the existentialist leaders, uh, uh, thought leaders, I guess you can call them, to the attention of your viewers. This is really a noble enterprise. And I know you're not making any money on this, so it has to be a labor of love. Are you making any money, Natalie? <laughs> Would you like to make some money on this? <laughs> Maybe you should, the viewers should send you a little token of appreciation because of all the work that you do. But this is noble work. And so I thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, those of your viewers or listeners who wish to contact me, I would be happy to speak with them. I'll give you my email address. It's Robert Kramer, one word, at gwu dot e d u robert kramer at g w u that stands for george washington university where i got my phd uh, dot edu 
So please, if those of you who got interested in Ronk and want to learn more, I want to get a copy of in advance of my article called Discovering the Existential Unconscious, Rollo May Encounters Otto Ronk, just send me a line and I will ship it off and we'll begin a new conversation. You're Thank you, Natalie. Not at all. Your, your enthusiasm is absolutely so <laughs> contagious. So I hope that your <laughs> email inbox will be brimming after this goes out. Well, put it on your website or wherever else you put information. So I'm happy to uh, speak to people. I am in Budapest. I was born in Budapest. I speak Hungarian. I lived in America for over 50 years. My parents and I and my sister and I uh, escaped from Hungary after 1956 when there was a revolution and the Russians invaded. Uh, but I, I make my home in Budapest. I love Budapest. And I invite anyone who wishes to come and visit me in Budapest to please send me a line and I will greet them and meet them and talk with them and take them out to great Hungarian restaurants. <laughs> that is absolutely lovely. Thank you so, so much. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And I'm sure everyone that sees it will too. Okay. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Natalie Fraser. And thanks to you for hosting this session and all the other sessions that you have hosted. You are a gift to the universe. As are you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.